started. Let me welcome you to our second David S. Sauerman Provocative Lecture of the Spring. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. My name is Justin Reitz, and I'm a professor with the Department of Economics. Uh, before I go further, can you please turn off all electronic gadgets, especially phones, or put them on silent, please, so we can have an uninterrupted discussion. Thank you. Um, also, please join us following the lecture at Flames Eatery at the corner of 4th Street in San Fernando for a meeting of the Barstool Economist. The Barstool is a virtual group of individuals who share economic ideas on the web. It is open to anyone who would like to join, either at Flames or on Yahoo Groups. We consider everyone a potential member, so you're welcome to join us. This lecture series started 17 years ago to foster our vision of higher education, challenging ideas and the development of critical thinking in an environment of respectful intellectual discussion. We hope you will relax and listen as Professor Beto discusses TRM Howard, one of the early leaders of the civil rights movement. Professor Beto will provide a question and answer period at the end of the presentation for the audience. Uh, let me say a few words about our speaker. Professor Beto is a professor of social sciences and a dean of arts and, and science at Stillman College, where she has received several awards for excellence in teaching and was inducted into the Zeta Phi, Zeta Phi Beta Hall of Fame. She received her MS in criminal justice and a PhD in political science from the University of Alabama and is also a research fellow at the Independent Independent Institute in Oakland. Professor Beto is the co-author of TRM Howard, Doctor, Entrepreneur, and Civil Rights Pioneer, and is also the author of the book Leadership Effectiveness in Community Policing, as well as many popular and scholarly articles. She has also appeared on numerous TV and radio programs across the country. Please join me in welcoming Professor Beto. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the Independent Institute for publishing our book this past May. Um, um, David Thoreau has been wonderful, and we appreciate this publication. So I'd love to tell you about T.R.M. Howard. Sometimes I think that students may know or have heard of Medgar Evers. Um, are there any in the audience that have heard of Medgar Evers? What about Fannie Lou Hamer and Rosa Parks? Most. Well, we make the claim that it's possible you may not have heard of Evers or Hamer, nor uh, Rosa Parks had it not been for Dr. Howard. And so we'll explain to you how that is the case. This is indeed a shocking statement. Even more shocking is that Howard is not exactly a household name. Even in specialists of history of civil rights, this was also true the year he died in 1976. The occasion of his death was not even mentioned in such news outlets as the New York Times, nor Time Magazine, or even for that matter, Ev Ebony Magazine. In 1955, it was an entirely different story, at least among African Americans. As a key leader of the civil rights movement in Mississippi, how it was a rising star who seemed poised to achieve even greater fame. He had achieved national prominence after the Supreme Court ruling in the Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which struck down legalized school segregation. Because Howard campaigned for enforcement of the ruling and later played a prominent role in finding evidence to convict the murderers of Emmett Till he became a favorite villain of segregationists in Mississippi. Now, I'll stop here to ask you, do you know the story of Emmett Till? Just a few. Well, I'll tell you about it in just a second. Dr. Howard won national praise from the black press the Chicago Defender placed Dr. Howard as the leader of um, the top people for civil rights in their newspaper. And back then, um, 
Martin Luther King was not even being mentioned and was not even on the list. Uh, the newspaper described Dr. Howard as Mississippi's most hated and feared Negro leader. In January of 1956, this is shortly after the murder of Emmett Till, is when he made this honor roll for Ebony Magazine. Now, let me tell you about the Till case. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy from Chicago that came to Money, Mississippi to visit his Uncle Mole in the summer of 1955. Being, um, I guess, playing with his friends, working in the cotton fields and going to the store for pop, um, he was bragging about this new wallet that he had, and it had a store-bought picture of a white female, and he told the guys, oh, this is my girlfriend. They said, yeah, right, man, we don't believe that junk. So if that's your girlfriend, it's a white lady in the store, why don't you go in and say something to her? So he took the challenge and went in, and when he did this, he broke southern custom in the deep, deep south in Mississippi. He bought some bubble gum, the story goes that instead of putting the money on the counter, he put it in her hand. And also, he said to her something like, how about a date, baby, or something like that. And that was too, too much. They went in, the boys, and got him out. She came out of the store going to the car to get a gun. They took off going home. And he begged them, don't tell my Uncle Mose. I don't want to get in trouble. And so they said, well, we're not going to tell. Well... That night, her husband and his half-brother came to get him. They got him out of the bed, uh, three, four in the morning. They took him, they beat him drastically, and um, in the end, asked him, do you still think blacks are just as good as whites? He said yes, and the half-brother, Milam, blew his brains out. They tied um, bobbed wire and tied it onto a heavy gin fan and threw it in the Tallahatchie River. They had a trial and the men were found innocent. And then later, um, a newspaperman for Look Magazine convinced the two brothers, half-brothers, um, now that you've been free, because of double jeopardy, you can never be convicted of this, so tell the truth. And he paid them about, I don't know, two or $3,000 a piece. And they told. They said that they'd done it and that um, at first they wanted to just rough him up, but then they ended up killing him. And, of course, Mississippi stepped away from these people at the time because they thought it's bad enough you got away with murder, and then now you're going to talk about it. So Dr. Howard was instrumental in trying to find witnesses to convict these two men all the time knowing that that probably would not happen, and it did not happen. Now, all of this happened before um, Alabama and the March to Selma and Martin Luther King. Unlike many civil rights leaders, Dr. Howard grew up in poverty. He was born in 1908 in Murray, Kentucky, a small town, born as Theodore Roosevelt Howard. His parents were poor laborers in a tobacco factory. In fact, they were what you call tobacco twisters, and they would help package the tobacco. And his mother worked at this local white hospital. And so she talked to the owner of the hospital, Dr. Will Mason, about giving her son Theodore um, a job. And he did. And he did such a good job. Um, he influenced Theodore's life in a lot of ways. Dr. Mason was a Seventh-day Adventist, and so um, T.R.M. Howard becomes a Seventh-day Adventist. And at the time, uh, the church would allow um, blacks to come to church with them, but they were segregated. Whites would sit in the front, blacks in the back, or in the balcony. So they had a small segregated black membership. Dr. Will Mason helped to pay um, school fees for uh, Howard. He came first to Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, which is a Seventh-day Adventist school. And then 
he expressed his gratitude, Howard expressed his gratitude to Dr. Mason by at this time changing his name to Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard, and that's how we get the TRM Howard. Howard earned his medical degree in 1935 as the only African American in the graduating class of the College of Medical Evangelists in Loma Linda, California. Today it's called Loma Linda University. On the day of his graduation, uh, let me back up before we get to his wife. Uh, this picture is um, Howard with his mother, and uh, that's the AME church behind them. And right now, we went there uh, recently, the church no longer stands. Um, and this is, at, on the day of his graduation, he married Helen Boyd. Um, and she came from a wealthy black family in Riverside, California. She helped to introduce Dr. Howard um, to the world of the black elite. And we say he never lost his common touch because he grew up poor, so he can talk with common people. And now he's meeting her, and he's getting introduced to uh, the money. In fact, um, Helen's brother, Edward Boyd, was the first black executive of Pepsi-Cola, and he died most recently in New York. In 1942, Theodore Howard came to Mount Bayou, Mississippi. He accepted the job of becoming the chief surgeon at the Taborian Hospital. Mount Bayou, Mississippi is in the western area of the state of Mississippi. Uh, it's in the Delta. And Mount Bayou was the, this particular hospital, this Taborian Hospital in Mount Bayou, the all black town, was the pride and joy of the hospital was the pride and joy of the International Order of 12 Knights and Daughters of Tabor. And I'll stop right here and tell you a little bit about uh, this fraternal society. The Knights and Daughters of Tabor had been founded by ex-slaves shortly after the Civil War. It was a fraternal society. In this respect, it was typical of many organizations during this period, both black and white, such as the Loyal Order of Moose, the Odd Fellows, the Masons, the Polish National Alliance, and even group like um, the Eastern Star. Like these other societies, it had a ritual, colorful dream team, drill teams, and was organized around a system of lodges. Before the rise of the welfare state, and this is uh, one of the reasons that we really promote the book, before the rise of the welfare state, Fraternal organizations were leading providers of social welfare. Through a system of cooperative insurance, they gave members and their families with such services as medical care, employment information, and orphanages. The statement of principles of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor read like thousands of other uh, organizations, both black and whites, these types of societies. It pledged to advance Christianity, education, morality and temperance, and the art of governing, self-reliance, and true manhood and womanhood. Sometimes historians have become so focused on dividing individuals into groups that they overlook the collective categories. And they don't see individuals like this that can get together and share the commonality of their lives. They're so interested in categorizing us by race, class, and gender, that they never forget to see that we're all human beings and we have things in common. These fraternal societies were leading examples of this common American heritage. When the Taborian Hospital opened in 1942, it included two major operating rooms, an x-ray room, sterilizer, incubators, electrocardiograph, blood bank, and laboratory. The hospital usually had two or three doctors on staff, all of which, of course, were black or, if you prefer, African-American. In 1944, the dues were like $8.40. In today's dollars, it would be like $1.20, I'm sorry, $120 a year. 
and that would entitle an adult member to 31 days of hospitalization. The fee for a child was about $1.20 per year, and that would be about $17 for a child. The hospital met with an enormous response from blacks in the Delta. With Howard as his chief surgeon, the Mississippi membership of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor grew rapidly to 50,000 men, women, and children. Most of the members were sharecroppers, farm laborers, and poor. Despite the fact that they lived in one of the most desperately poor regions of the United States, they were able to provide for their own, listen to me, their own social welfare by pooling their own resources. And if you take anything away from what I'm telling you, it shows the ingenuity of people, how they can indeed do for themselves. It's amazing that Dr. Howard found time for his work as a chief surgeon. During these years, he delivered hundreds, perhaps thousands of babies, performed as many as 12 operations per day, and then he decided to split off from the Knights and Daughters of Tabor and organize his own society. He called it the United Order of Friendship. It opened a hospital in Mount Bayou just across the street from the Taborian Hospital. But just like the Taborian Hospital, it provided low-cost health care for thousands of blacks for the next 20 years, all without any government aid. For Howard, both fraternal hospitals were springboards to creation of an array of businesses, and this is another take. If you see Dr. Howard here, he's the man with the hat sitting on maybe a tractor. And he establishes first, the first swimming pool for blacks in the state of Mississippi, a 1,600-acre cotton and cattle plantation, and this is him sitting on his farm, a restaurant with a beer garden, a home construction firm, and even a small zoo. He didn't mind um, displaying his wealth. He drove around in an air-conditioned Cadillac. He purchased a large home, and here you can see him sitting with his family uh, and friends and having a maid in 1950s. 40s and 50s in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. He would indulge in colorful pastimes such as betting on horses, raising pheasants, quails, and hunting dogs. During this period, he purchased, again, creating businesses and including, in, excuse me, increasing his wealth. He purchased um, the Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company to make money. It sold both burial and hospitalization insurance to blacks. And although Howard continued in this role, he increasingly turned his attention to civil rights after 1951. That year, he founded the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. Through the council, Howard would champion the message of self-help, mutual aid, thrift, and equal political rights. The council weaved together the ideas of Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, vowing, quote, to guide our people in their civic responsibilities regarding education, registration and voting, law enforcement, tax paying, the preservation of property, the value of saving, and in all things which will make us stable, qualified, conscientious, citizens. Howard's example had a crucial impact on the political education of a future civil rights leader, and I asked you all earlier if you'd heard of Medgar Evers. I'll take a moment and tell you why Medgar was important in civil rights. Um, fresh from college, Dr. T.R.M. Howard hired Medgar Evers. He's sitting here on this picture with his wife, Merle hired him to work for him, his first job out of college, and he would sell insurance for Dr. Howard's company. And at the time, as Medgar would sell insurance, he would encourage black to, blacks to register with the NAACP and to register to vote. 
Well, um, Medgar Evers was killed in Jackson, Mississippi, getting out of his car, slain, shot down with his wife and children in the house. And so for encouraging blacks to vote, Medgar Evers lost his life. Evers' wife, sitting here with him, Merle Evers, who was recently chairperson of the National NAACP, worked for Dr. Howard's company as a typist. Howard made quite an impression on Merle. She told us that, quote, one look told you he was a leader, kind, affluent, and intelligent. That rare Negro in Mississippi who had somehow beaten the system. Medgar Evers not only sold insurance, but also promoted membership in the NAACP. Like Booker T. Washington in the earlier years and Malcolm X in the 1960s, Howard combined political activism with an emphasis on self-help and racial economic cooperation. Urging blacks to patronize black businesses, he, war he warned them that the economic security of the race is tied up in the Negro support of Negro businesses. The council quickly sparked controversy when it distributed bumper stickers on the back of cars calling for a boycott of service stations that did not provide restrooms for blacks. The slogan was, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. This demand was risky in the context of Mississippi, and this boycott was successful, and it all took place about four years before Martin Luther King organized his Montgomery bus boycott. The council became best known, however, because of its annual rallies in Mount Bayou. In promoting these rallies, Dr. Howard proved himself to be tremendously persuasive and unusually gifted as a promoter. Howard loved having a good time, and his love of good time was infectious. He incorporated it into the civil rights organizing. If you look here, you'll see crowds. Crowds flocked to these annual rallies of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, a grassroots civil rights and self-help organization that Dr. Terry M. Howard founded in 1951. They would come to hear speakers such as Representative William Dawson, one of the two black members of Congress, and at that time also Thurgood Marshall. Here you see uh, proof that Thurgood Marshall was there in a parade riding with Representative Charles Diggs of Michigan, and he was the second um, black congressman, and they both came to Mount Bayou, Mississippi. They also came to see and to hear such such entertainers as Mahalia Jackson, and here she is sitting under a tree and um, with them. So when I tell people that these people came to the small um, hamlet in the Mississippi Delta, um, we can prove that it's true. She really did. She came and she performed for them. And they would compete in sporting events. They had sample homemade barbecue, and Fannie Lou Hamer, um, attended and cooked, and Dr. Howard really got Hamer involved in, um, re you know, getting people registered to vote. I told you, I asked you all first if you'd heard of um, Hamer. How many again? Only one, maybe? Well, Fannie Lou Hamer, let me just tell you a little bit about her. Fannie Lou Hamer was what we call a sharecropper. She lived in a house on a plantation owned by the white plantation owner. And they would live there and pay rent, and then they work on the fields. They work in the cotton fields. And so by her going, trying to encourage blacks to register to vote, the owner kicked her off the land, told her she could not live there any longer. She could no longer work for him. She moved in with her sister. Bullets came flying all through the sister's house, shooting, trying to kill her. Sister put her out. You cannot put my children and my family in danger. And so as she continued, she was on a bus, and the bus was pulled over by the police. They hauled them all to jail, 
and the police officer came into our cell and drug her out, and they started beating her with cow prods, billy clubs, hammers. They broke her up. They kicked her so bad. Uh, she never really recuperated from those injuries and later died um, with numerous, numerous ailments and maladies. And that was Fannie Lou Hamer. So until 1950s, Howard's relations with local whites had been cordial. They gradually gave him some respect because of his business and organizational acumen. This all changed after Howard became more deeply involved in civil rights. The breaking point was 1954 at a meeting with the governor. This picture that you're looking at now is at the rallies, this is him over a big bucket of chicken, that's fried chicken that they're going to feed the people. And if you'll notice on the box, there's a gun. One of the reasons Howard survived so much of this is he always believed in the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms. So he kept a gun with him at all times because he was living in dangerous times in a dangerous state. At a meeting with the governor, Dr. Howard drew heated criticism from the white press. When he called for strict enforcement of the court's ruling on the Brown versus the Board of Education, according to one account, the governor reproved Howard by saying, now look here, you know and I know that if we ask all Negroes in the state how they felt about integration, 90% would be opposed to it. Don't you believe that? Howard replied to the governor, Governor, if I told you that 90% of blacks in Mississippi did not want to go to heaven, would you believe that? Well, the newspapers had a fit. They reprinted the exchange under the banner headline, Black Surgeon Calls Governor a Liar. And then, Howard's attempts to organize support for enforcement of the Brown decision almost immediately ran afoul with the newly formed White Citizens Councils, which were especially powerful in the Mississippi Delta. In 1954, the council launched a credit squeeze. They put pressure on local banks and other credit agencies to deny loans to blacks who took part in civil rights. The, the um, credit squeeze was hard on poor black people. So with the help of the NAACP, Dr. Howard uh, coordinated an, um, an, uh, a campaign. What he did, they had made him a um, member of the board of the Tri-State Bank in Memphis, Black Bank in Memphis. He encouraged black businesses churches, voluntary associations, to transfer their accounts all to the black-owned Tri-State Bank. Within a few months, the bank's deposits for the, from these sources swelled to nearly $300,000. Tri-State used these funds to grant loans to victims of the credit squeeze. Howard's efforts to defend himself ran afoul of the Mississippi gun control laws. First, some backgrounds, if you all don't know. The first significant gun, con gun control laws in the United States arose in the American South as a means to disarm blacks. During the early 19th century, a standard feature of the slave codes was to prohibit slaves and free blacks from carrying guns. In the decades after the Civil War, Jim Crow laws often attempted to ban and restrict the sale of cheap guns, uh, conceivably handguns which poor blacks could afford, such as the Saturday night specials. White racists also feared that black civil rights workers would be better able to deter harassment if they could carry handguns. The discriminatory nature of gun control in the South 
was still apparent in Mississippi during the 1950s. The state required special permits for individuals to carry handguns on their persons, persons or in their cars. And guess what? Blacks rarely received these permits. They'd go down to get the permits. They were not issued the permits. The ever resourceful Howard, of course, found a way to evade the law. Whenever the police pulled them over, if anybody in the car had guns, they all were arrested. Dr. Howard would stow his handgun in a special secret hiding place in his car. Police never could find it, and it was always caught. The fallout from the Emmett Till in the nearby Tallahatchie County in August of uh, 1955 represented the culmination of the beginning of the end in Howard's career in Mississippi. This um, cartoon that you're looking at now, I think the man running, the, uh, the information says something about the um, Klan. So he's part of the Klan. He just finished hanging them. The people that are hanging by the neck until dead are Reverend George Lee, Lamar Smith and Emmett Till, the, the smallest body. And that's Howard and um, Roy Wilkins of the president of the NAACP running to the rescue. Now with um, George Lee, Reverend George Lee and Lamar Smith, um, one of them was standing in the courthouse square with the white sheriff and a lot of witnesses White man walked up and blew his brains out. When they had the trial, all the witnesses could not tell who did it, so nobody was ever caught. Reverend George Lee was, that was Lamar Smith. Reverend George Lee was driving home uh, to Belzoni, Mississippi, and a car pulled up beside him and shot through his window of the car, um, double barrel shotgun. When the um, sheriff found the fragments of the bullets in him, um, he said, oh, he had an accident. This is just a feeling from a tooth he had. And so, of course, uh, nobody was ever convicted of murdering these uh, three, these three men. The murder of Teal put the issue of racial injustice and thus civil rights on the front burner. For many Americans, it put a face on the problem for the first time. I don't think I need to go any further into that, but the picture you're looking at now is Dr. Howard standing with a support to Teal's mother. Uh, anyone that would come, first of all, back in this time, they did not have hotels that would rent rooms to blacks. So if you came from uh, Chicago or Detroit, you'd have to stay in somebody's home. So Dr. Howard's home was open to uh, the mother of Teal for the trial, as well as the representatives that came down. And so he would escort her to the trial. And to keep them safe, he hired a man to guard his house so they could rest at night. And he put it out on the street so everybody would know. The man that is guarding my house has a sawed off double bear shotgun and he's hard of seeing. His eyesight's not good at all. So if he hears anything, he's shooting in that direction. And so of course this was uh, beneficial because nobody came and, and, and nobody was killed. Um, during the trial, Dr. Howard tried to find witnesses that would testify of um, what they saw, what they heard, to help convict these two half-brothers. Willie Reed uh, was 18 years old at the time, and he heard in the barn, maybe three, four in the morning, as he stopped to drink some water out of a pump um, faucet or well, um, he heard in the barn, Lord have mercy, help somebody help. Mama, mama, 
and he thought and he left and he ran down to Miss Amanda Bradley on this picture. Amanda Bradley is the lady with the scarf tied around her head. He said, Miss Bradley, somebody's getting beaten up, beaten up there in that barn. She said, well, come, son, let's go back up there. They walked back to the, um, by the pump. The half-brother, J.W. Milam, stepped out from the barn with a gun strapped on his waistline. And he said to them, you hear anything, boy? No, sir, I didn't hear anything. Well, get away from here. And so they left. Well, Willie Reed, at 18, found enough nerve to testify at the, the, the murder trial. And after that, it was so taxing on him. First of all, immediately after the trial, they moved him to Chicago for safety reasons, and he had a nervous breakdown. When we talked to him 50 years later, he was an older man, and you could see the damage that all of this had caused him throughout his life him being on the 18 at the time and suffering a nervous breakdown, it changed his life forever. Now, Howard was such with guns that he even had a Thompson machine, machine gun behind the door. I have no idea where he got a Thompson machine gun from, but he had one. And so they realized early on that they were not going to convict these killers. And so um, Dr. Howard got all of um, these people out of the courtroom and back to Chicago and away from Mississippi uh, to save their lives. And so at the end of the trial, they asked, uh, it took about an hour and a half of deliberation, and they asked, why did it take so long? And he said, um, one of the jurors said, if we hadn't stopped to drink a pop, it wouldn't have taken that long. And so they acquitted them. And so Dr. Howard then went on a national speaking tour talking about Mississippi. He talked to thousands of people in cities like Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, Baltimore. And this is a picture of him in Philadelphia. And if you can see the crowds, this is, he's down there on the stage and this is the crowd that he commanded telling about the Teal case. Also, on November the 27th, 1955, he comes to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, this is what you're looking at now is him arguing with J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI at the time. Uh, this is in a, a, a newspaper clipping. And the argument, of course, was that Howard said, how is it that the FBI can, from the ashes of a downed plane and the black box, find out who took the plane down? But you cannot find who kills a black person in Mississippi. And so Dr. Howard had an um, argument back and forth with Jed Hoover. As a matter of fact, Jed Hoover did indeed write a letter um, to the newspapers. They published it uh, talking about Dr. Howard and how he was just um, stirring up stuff. So, and that was amazing because uh, you would not expect the FBI director to um, personally reply, but he did uh, on this occasion. Now, in um, November, late November 1955, this um, is later in his life, um, he moved to Chicago and this is his home. He ended up, he kept changing himself, ending up being a great uh, hunter with uh, African animals. And this is him with Jesse Owens. Uh, he was a big party goer, having parties. As a matter of fact, Dr. Howard was very instrumental in Operation Push, um, Jesse Jackson. Uh, the idea for Push originated in Dr. Howard's basement. And this is him. Uh, he developed a friendship medical center in Chicago. He left Mississippi in 1956. And um, before he left and went to Chicago and created a new life for himself, he was invited to Alabama 
four days before the famous um, Rosa Parks not giving up her seat. Rosa Parks was sitting in the audience at the church uh, listening to Dr. Howard talk about Emmett Till and what all had happened in Mississippi. And we talked to Rosa Parks before she passed away. We have her on tape. And we asked, uh, were you thinking about Till? She said, yes. She said that day she had not planned on doing that, but she was a, seamstr a seamstress and she was tired. And when she sat down on the bus and the bus driver ordered her to get up and move to the back, she said, I was just too tired to move. And I said, no. And because she said no, they arrested her and put her in jail. And so for Alabama, uh, Howard's speech was on the newspaper. And then four days later, December 1st, uh, you, had, um, you had Rosa Parks going to jail. And later, Dr. Howard moves to Chicago. And really the reason more than anything else was his wife to get her out of harm's way and get her back to the kind of life she'd always lived rather than being you know, in a poor environment in Mississippi. Now they would go back to Chicago. If you look at this picture, you notice that the nurses at the clinic are dressed in the um, Nightingale outfits, and he's dressed in a nice white suit. Well, this was all the time. They tell the story of Dr. Howard changing clothes maybe two and three times a, a day that he was a shop dresser and he knew it and he wanted everybody to see his uh, wealth and his progress and how well he's done. And so he dies in 1976. And one thing is before, um, this is his clinic and people that work for him sitting in front of him, in front of him is his daughter, Sandra. Um, we got a lot of information from her before she passed away some of the letters um, that her father had written to her and information about his life. And for Mississippi, um, Dr. Howard was instrumental in paving the way for civil rights victories, the victories of 1956 and up to 65. These civil rights pioneers built their success on earlier foundation of black self-help, mutual aid, and business investment. Without organizations such as the Knights and Daughters of Tabor and businesses such as the Magnolia Mutual Life uh, Company, it's hard to imagine the rise of the modern civil rights movement. And so we know that Dr. Howard was instrumental in Mississippi. And we also know that just as Martin Luther King is getting started, that Dr. Howard had a connection with him. Howard is buried in Chicago. And again, another statement I want to make for our students in here. If Dr. Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard can bring himself up from abject poverty, being so poor that he had to shoot squirrels and rabbits to eat, to live, and becoming a millionaire by creating these businesses in the poor area of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, of all places. He creates businesses that uh, provide wealth. The point that I'm making is if he could do all of that, how far can you go? Thank you. Hi, uh, this is, uh, I'm Fred. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about these uh, friendly societies, these self-help organizations that arose and how they provided uh, services like medical services. Uh, could you just uh, explain that a little more? Sure. Um, one of the 
before I talk about the organizations, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Howard. When he would go into a, a room at the hospital, he treated the patients and whatever ailment they had, he gave operations and got them feeling better. He would also give them a bag of seeds to go home and plant so they'd have food, they could grow their own food and could eat. These types of organizations would pool their resources. They would help people that were in need of help. Um, they created orphanages that would take care of children whose parents had died or were killed. The thing about Mount Bayou, Mississippi is by it being an all black town, all of the um, sheriffs or police officers, the mayor, all of the business people, the people that ran the town uh, were African American. So if people were running for their lives, let's say you're accused of something you didn't do, if you could just get to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, you could get to safety. And so it was a safe haven for black people shortly from, from shortly after the Civil War until even now. I don't think you have to run as fast or as hard, but it still is a place where blacks can feel safe. So these organizations took care of their own. They took care of the poor. Um, they would pool their resources if someone needed something and give. And, you know, I think about um, in churches, they have, like, offerings that they take up. They take up for the poor. And I guess when somebody's lights are cut off, they may uh, hand money out or buy groceries, especially holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas. These organizations would have food baskets and buckets and boxes that they would give to poor people or to someone whose father was um, maybe hurt or out of work, and the children would have food to eat. So again, these organizations provided a lot of services um, and I think more so that for children, and we were talking about it, the idea of, of welfare even when welfare started uh, back right after the Great Depression. Uh, it was set up for as a temporary stopgap maybe for people who fell on hard times, didn't have jobs, and it was supposed to be temporary, and again, to feed children. Children can't feed themselves, so it was always to help children. And of course, it kind of ballooned into something uh, quite different, and, and, and so um, our government is gradually making changes to maybe correct some of that. But again, these organizations did um, what government is doing now for some people. These organizations did for their own. Do we know what motivated um, TRM to separate from the Knights of Tabor and create his own society? <laughs> yes, we do. Um, I should say politics. Uh, he was the kind of man that um, was a leader and would run things. And then you had, um, I can't think of his name, it was P.M. Smith, but he was um, sort of like the head person of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. And he had been running things long before uh, Dr. Howard came to Mount Bayou, and he refused to step aside and let T.R. Howard run him. So they got into a little bickering, and so Howard decided he'd create his own and do his own thing. So, yeah, we do know. Hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, your book has the word entrepreneur in it. Yes. And I know that the first big biography of Booker T. Washington, written by a professor from the University of Tennessee three years ago, mm -hmm. it's not being carried by the African American bookstore in West Oakland. The mm -hmm. bookstore's been there 40 or 50 years. They're not carrying the book. Do you think such bookstores are going to carry your book? And how is your book being received in the African American community and the political community here in the United States? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, as far as I know, it's going over quite well. We've had uh, comments and people who bought it and talked about it. 
And the thing that they see it as is if this um, African-American can do as well as he did in such trying times, it's a good example for others to be about the business of taking care of your own, to think and to find ways to succeed and to be successful. Um, I have um, given um, talks about Dr. Howard to African-American students because I work at a historically black um, college. And so we've talked about him and they're interested because first of all, it was, it's surprising that not only is it that whites may not know of how devastating um, segregation was, blacks don't know either, young black students. Uh, their parents won't talk about it because it's hard, they don't want to remember, um, they, want to, they want better for their children so they don't tell them about it. And so we have these same conversations that, okay, this is a man who went through a lot, but he was determined to do better. What did that mean? It meant that even in his studies, he achieved greatness. He studied. He perfected his craft. He was known as an excellent surgeon. People talked about him all over, from Tennessee, Meharry Medical School, California, about this doctor that was doing wonderful work in the city of Mount Bayou, Mississippi. So he became the president of the National uh, Medical Association. Um, so nationally, they knew him as a, an outstanding surgeon. And so um, that's uh, another lesson that they can learn for, from uh, this story of Dr. Howard is that, okay, whatever your um, craft is or your chosen profession or your discipline, you make sure you're the best. You're the best at what you do. And so there are many lessons that we can gain from Dr. Howard. And so we do. How is it received positively? Um, the argument I get uh, from people in Alabama is, why did you have to go to Mississippi? Why couldn't you write about something in Alabama? Um, but again, we got to Mississippi by looking at fraternal societies, uh, finishing a, a previous book. And uh, once we got there, we heard about this wonderful man, Dr. Howard, and we said, wait, have you heard of him? No. And we started asking people about it, and they had not. So we started to do the research to find out who is this man that people are asking us about, and we've never heard of him. And so we were the first to write the book about T.R.M. Howard. Since then, there have been a lot of books and articles written about Dr. Howard, as well as movies created about the uh, Emmett Till murder. So things have changed drastically since we initially um, started this research. Um, I have heard a lot of opinions on uh, you know, using the term black versus African-American, and I was wondering if um, you had any preference between the two terms, and if you do, um, why that is. <laughs> oh. Well, I laugh because I tell my students, which is true, I don't know another group that have had so many names to identify, from blacks to colored, African-American, Negro, I mean, you can go on with the list. And I also tell them, I came up in the days of James Brown. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And so I do know where the African-American term came from, an author writing and decided to write African-American. And so it became the um, politically correct term. But to be honest with you, I don't have a problem with any of it. Uh, you can call me by my name. Uh, I am black, and uh, when the sun shines on my skin, oh, it glows. So I love who I am. And another thing, um, I have white students as well, and they'll say, well, Dr. Beto, you talk so to encourage blacks. What about us? And I tell them, um, Olive Olay had this um, saying about um, loving the skin that you're in. And so I tell my students, 
It doesn't matter. Love yourself just as you are. You know, everybody can talk about Tina Turner's beautiful legs, but they don't walk for me. These legs carry me, so I love mine. And so I try to teach my students to love themselves in all of their maladies and all of their beautiful differences because there's not one of us that is duplicated ever, never, never have been. We're an original, so we love it. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I am black. Uh, I am African. I have bloodline 80% Africa, 13% um, Scott Irish, and 3% Native American, and that is who I am. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I, um, I'm doing too many things, so I've got to slow down. I'm working on a, a book about uh, Stillman College. Um, they want me to go back um, in the direction of slavery and bring it forward and tell how when the school was, was built, there was um, a building that's still there. It's in disrepair now but it served as a, a hospital for blacks because the new hospital would only treat whites. Blacks would go and they'd be in the hall or would not be treated at all. And so this place was a place that blacks could go and get care. And so again, I'm working on that. Um, and um, shortly after I return, uh, we're going to be talking about um, right after the Civil War during Reconstruction, we had blacks in Congress. We also had the passing of the 13th, 14th, um, and 15th Amendments. And so uh, we don't talk about that enough. So I'm working to change that a little bit. As a matter of fact, um, oh, I can't think of his name, but um, mm, he's a retired NASA geophysicist that is doing some work, and forgive me, his name just evaded me, but um, on Tuesday he will be speaking at the University of Alabama and I will be there to introduce him. So I've got um, several projects. Uh, one last thing I do is um, there's a, a, a conference, an African American conference that's being held. It's a national civil rights conference and um, I tell them about um, Tuscaloosa and Tuscaloosa civil rights and how um, Tuscaloosa and college students, uh, what they did in order to um, help uh, march for the past and then later uh, Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But just before that, uh, what those college students did to change Tuscaloosa. And so my students don't know that. Um, and so I, I enjoy doing that kind of research. Uh, there was one, and I apologize that I can't give the name because the name had changed, but there was one that continued on. Um, when we go to Mount Bayou now, it's um, very, very poor. Uh, the state has, they um, renamed the main street uh, TRM Howard Highway after our research. They put um, signs up, but then they made a four lane express to come around Mount Bayou. So now people don't go through it anymore, and uh, it's changed considerably. Um, you still have the, the African American farmers who have uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. But as far as prosperity, it is not there. I have a question. Um, so uh, for Mr. Howard, what were some of the, I guess, does your book cover like the authors or some of the people that influenced him that came up with his, uh, I guess, life philosophy to become 
a multimillionaire or, or people that are influenced? I know you mentioned one and he added it to his name, but does your book or do you go more into it as far as the people that made him up during and after, I guess, the movement and prior to? Well, we can compare him to people like um, Booker T. Washington from the grassroots, you know, starting at home and building up from the ground. Uh, and even some of the ideas of um, W.E.B. Du Bois, where he believed that education and expanding the mind would change everything for African Americans. So we compare him to those people. But to be honest with you, everything that I um, read and heard about and talked with people about when we did interviews led us to believe that he was an individual. He was an individualist that decided within himself, this is who I am. And he created his own life. He did what he thought was best. And so I, I'm not sure he followed any one um, philosophy or directive. I think that he decided, I'm going to study. He decided, I'm going to be the best. He decided, I'm going to honor Dr. Mason because he was so good to me. He decided, even when working for Mason, to do the best that he could do. And in all of that, um, I think it, it revealed uh, something about him, something about the man. And so even with um, this strong-willed person, because some of the people with the NAACP thought he was too militant, he would incite violence, and we want to uh, calm it down and that kind of thing. But he didn't believe in letting other people tell him who he was. And so I think some people admired him for that. Hello, thank you for being here. Um, I would like to know your thoughts um, in regards to revisiting the events that happened in our country's history and those events possibly causing resentment and division amongst race today. Um, well, I guess I should get personal with this because um, slavery did happen and I have family that came through as slaves and after slavery we can track my father's family as owning property and how they gained that property and how they bought and, and worked hard to have. Um, for me because um, historically, white men have always liked black women. Even under slavery, they had babies with black slaves. So there were always blacks that had white blood and was mixed. So you can hate that that happened, but we don't live in the past. We live in the present. And so are there lessons from the past that we carry forward? I say absolutely. I say that understand for African Americans, we're a small portion of the total population here in the United States. Had it not been for whites joining with the great civil rights movement, it never would have been so successful. Whites saw how bad they were treating blacks in Alabama on the television and they started flying in driving in, bust in to Selma, Alabama, saying this is not right, we're better than this. And so I think even when uh, we had the bus boycott, white women uh, needed their maids to clean their houses. They needed their um, black helpers to rock their babies and take care of their children. They would get in their cars and drive and pick up the worker that's walking on the road because they refuse to ride that bus anymore and bring them to work. So because the whites stepped in and stepped up, it became successful. So when we're look at, looking at today and going forward, my life, I'll tell you, and this is the first time I've ever mentioned this in a speech, but my life is totally different. 
My husband is white. I have a eight-year-old daughter that's blue-eyed blonde. Well, she was blonde. At eight, she's is turning brown. We just cut her hair and cut all the blonde out of it. So, and she, I'm mommy. I've always been her mother from before she was ever conceived. And so she grows up having a black mother and a white father. And she knows she's black. I meant white, excuse me. She knows she's white. How does, she, how does this happen? When she went to kindergarten, they told her, you are blue-eyed blonde. They told her, teachers and teachers more so than children, you're white. They told her. So she comes home, mommy. Uh, they tell me I'm, I'm white. Yes, you're white. You look like your daddy, who's white. I look like my daddy, who's black. And we laugh about it. So I give her a strong sense of self that you do not allow someone else to dictate to you who you are. You know who you are. And so this is how we live. So when I uh, teach and I encourage blacks and some whites may say, oh, you sound like you hate white people. I, say, I laugh and say, no, that's not the case. So why does one race have to feel like they're being slighted just because I'm encouraging another. You don't, there's no competition. We're all individuals trying to make it, trying to live the best life possible. So um, sure, we lost friends when we married about 21 years ago. Blacks that could not see how can you possibly marry a white man as evil as white people have been to blacks. Then some, white, some black people stepped away white people, how can you marry a black woman? And some white people stepped away. So everybody will have a right to think and feel and believe like they want to believe. That is about the um, freest of rights that you will ever have, and that's the right to believe what you want to believe. Anything else can be modified with laws, because once you start to speak, once you start to act, then you've got laws that will regulate. But for thinking, it's about as free as you get. So again, um, it doesn't bother me because I know as an individual, I have a right to enjoy my life and to live it to the fullest, and I do. Yes. Well, um, he was close to his mother, as you could see them standing there together. So she gave him a grounding in, I think, with um, everybody that becomes however successful that they are, it has to start somewhere. And I think she did have a profound effect on him because she loved him. And um, early on, um, his mother divorced and remarried. So for his father and mother, he was the only child. She did have other children. Uh, when she married again, she had six children, and she stayed married to that husband the duration of, of her life. So for um, Howard, he was one of a kind. And um, I think she brought him up um, the best she could, um, taking him to church and giving him a grounding. But I think... Uh, just as children, I had a grandmother who was born in 1900, and she told me at the turn of the century, she said, um, I raised my children the best I could. Some of them turned out good and some not so good. So I think even with mothers, you can do all you can do for all of your children, but children have different personalities. They take different influences from different people and avenues, and they become the person that they choose to be. And I think this is true with Dr. Howard. I think um, growing up poor affected him wanting to have wealth. I think he decided that he would never be that poor again. And if it meant working two, three, and four different jobs and creating businesses that would 
work for him, he would do it. Um, I think um, seeing that type of poverty, I think it affected him. And so I think that would be one reason why he wanted to be, quote unquote, successful. And, you know, people measure, measure success in different ways. Some people buy money, some people buy family, some people buy um, satisfaction within themselves. So I don't know, how did Dr. Um, Howard measure success? I think it was visually he wanted people to see that poor people in the, the Mississippi Delta, you can work hard. I've done it. You can drive a new Cadillac. I'm driving one. You can have beautiful clothes and a better life. I can be that example for you. And I think economic uplift, I think as he lifted himself, he reached back and lifted others. He gave them jobs, he paid them money, and they all came up because of Dr. Howard. And I think that is quite admirable. Um, hmm. that's a little difficult to answer. First of all, uh, when you look at these fraternal societies, they came up in a time before welfare, and they lasted through maybe early welfare, but they came up in a time where they fulfilled a need. And so um, for orphanages and for other training of students and for um, um, teaching and schooling and educating. Um, I think they did a lot to benefit people in their areas where these uh, societies were. A lot of them were um, connected um, to religion and church and the idea of, um, I don't know, that you help your, your fellow man. There were people that uh, joined um, Dr. Howard's group and worked with him. And so, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> so, one of the things that, in writing the book on fraternal societies, um, that's my husband's book. I was telling them earlier that we went to Canada because they wanted us, the government, they wanted to hear about fraternal societies fraternal societies, and how they took care of their own. And so even now, I think, even if we no longer have them, we do. We still have them. I don't know if they play as great a role as they did back then, but I think the ideas are the same. And I think, to be honest with you, that some of our best leaders, if they have the idea to make people in the United States live a better life and to create laws and policies to benefit all Americans, um, then I think that's a follow or a carry through from these fraternal societies. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time. So I'd like to thank Professor Beto for a wonderful talk. Um, please join me in offering her a final round of applause. <coughs> <laughs>